Good evening. My name is Bob Stein. I'm the uh, Interim Dean of the College of Continuing and Professional Studies. On behalf of the College and Learning Life, welcome to this, our first event of this year's Headliner Series. Uh, last year, we, uh, well, first of all, let me say thanks for being here. There's something else you could have been at tonight <laughs> across the river, but uh, you all made a wise choice, so thanks for being here. <clears throat> So you see a full room tonight. Last year we set a record attendance for headliners, thanks to many of you. We had more than 2,600 people attend uh, our events last year, and we did sell out uh, tonight's event. So uh, we're already well on our way to setting a new record. Um, and we have more fascinating speakers already lined up for this year, and expect to draw capacity crowds for those as well. So if you haven't done so already, you can still buy season passes, series passes for all of the headliners events to make sure you actually have a seat in this room. Uh, you can do that after the event tonight and as an added bonus, if you do that now, you will save $30 off the single ticket prices. So I encourage you to do that out of the front desk after we're done. Uh, have several special welcomes I would like to do tonight. Uh, as if you've been here before, you know we invite our college and the schools, teachers and students and PSEO students and some others to attend and we have a great representation this evening. And there's a special group here from Totino Grace High School. Where, where are you? There's about 15 or 18 of them over there. So thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, we also have uh, 10 past fellows uh, from the university's Advanced Careers Initiative. It's a program we uh, partner with very closely, so uh, appreciate having them here. Also, I'd like to welcome back uh, CCAP's Dean Emeritus Mary Nichols, sitting over here. Um, she, she's been kind enough to let me keep doing this, so uh, it's nice. But also, let me, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Dean John Coleman. John is the uh, Dean of the College of Liberal Arts here on campus. Uh, and. He's also a political scientist, as our speaker is tonight, and I, I was reading through his research interests, and, and John, we may to in, need to invite you to do one of these. Listen to his research interests, see if this uh, rings a bell with what's going on. Uh, he likes to look at political parties, elections and votings, divided government, and legislative executive relations. Hmm. <laughs> All things in the news every day. And then uh, finally, let me welcome family and friends uh, and students that uh, our speaker has here tonight. So, and just a few uh, sort of announcements, updates on the university and the college before we get going tonight. As you probably all know, the university installed its 17th and very first uh, female president, Joan Gable, a few weeks ago. Um, there, there was a, it was a great inauguration event. Uh, there was a little pomp involved in it. There was a very nice mini parade down Scholars Walk. We had lunch on Northrop Plaza. She gave a great inaugural speech, and I would say she's off to a great start uh, here at the university. And for us as a college, we're also off to a really good start. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about some, some of the things about our college you may not uh, see uh, if you come just to this. Uh, this fall, we started with about 700 undergraduate students and 250 graduate students. We have 600 PSEO students and ten, more than 10,000 college and the school students that we serve. Uh, we have uh, more than 4,000 learners participating in our professional development courses. Uh, we have a conference services unit that, that, that uh, manages, schedules, helps schedule, and manage uh, basically a conference every week of the year, almost every week. Many, many learning life activities. You can uh, see some of those in the thing that's on your uh, chair and then much, much more going on in college. So it's always fun to get back into the academic year. There's a lot of excitement. Uh, and amazingly, they're already talking about midterms, which is like, we just started, didn't we? Um, so now to this evening's event. Uh, before we begin, as always, I ask that you make sure that your cell phones are muted. Uh, if you're active on social media, you can follow a Learning Life and on uh, Facebook and Twitter using the hashtag UMN headliners. Uh, and, and so to tonight, the founding fathers considered the US Supreme Court to be the weakest of the three branches of government. Alexander Hamilton noted it, it held neither sword nor purse strings. Yet uh, Supreme Court justices are able to influence policy for decades because once appointed, you all know this, they serve until they retire, die, or actually they can be impeached too. Uh, the average tenure of a justice is 15 years, though many serve longer. 
So the longest serving one is Chief Justice John Marshall, who was appointed by Thomas Jefferson. He served a record 34 years. So the longest serving current justice is Clarence Thomas, and he's been on the court since when? 1991, I heard it out here, 28 years. So he's, he's approaching that record. According to our speaker this evening, Dr. Timothy Johnson, because justices hold their offices for such long periods, the Supreme Court has arguably become the most powerful branch of government. Tonight, Dr. Johnson will discuss his insights about how the court decides, how the justices interact with one another, and what uh, it, all this means for the 2019 term, which began actually just this last Monday. Dr. Timothy R. Johnson is Morse alumni, distinguished professor of political science and law at the University of Minnesota, and a nationally recognized expert on US Supreme Court oral arguments and decision making. Tim is a former co-editor of Law and Society Review and is the author or co-author of four books and provides commentary frequently for some places you maybe have heard about, uh, The Economist, The Guardian, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Slate, National Public Radio, and local media, among many other outlets. He's also one of the lead researchers on a project called SCOTUS Notes. Uh, it's a crowd, they use crowdsourcing to digitize the handwritten notes of Supreme Court justices. Tim, hopefully you'll talk about that a little bit tonight or get a question about it if, if you don't talk about it. And beyond his scholarly research, Tim is a recipient of numerous awards for his work in the classroom as a mentor and a teacher. He's received many university and national awards uh, for both his teaching and his advising. And among other reasons we love Tim, uh, he's the faculty coordinator for our college and the school's course, American Democracy in a Changing World, which was completed by more than 600 high school students last year. So please join me in a warm headlines welcome for Dr. Tim Johnson. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Those words were all too kind from Bob. Some of them were true. Most of them probably not. I appreciate you all having me here. I recognize some of you from courses that I've taught um, in the Learning Life program. I just view this as a larger classroom. Um, I will try my best to not speak too quickly and try my best not to speak too long. As one of my advisors down at the Swedish school, Gustavus Adolphus, said to me, and some of you have heard this joke, he thought when I graduated in 1993 that I was the most verbose son of a bitch he'd ever met. <laughs> and so I will try to hold it to 45 minutes uh, so that I can uh, we, uh, wield questions. Um, that won't be easy for me, but I will try to make it happen. So the question is, is the court still the least dangerous branch? And I'm slightly tweaked uh, at, at um, Dean Stein because he took a little bit of my fire with a few things that he said. That I'm just kidding. That's, that's neither here nor there. But I will repeat at least one of the quotes from Alexander Hamilton. Um, and what I want to propose to you today is that there was a debate between, as my clicker did work, there it goes, there was a debate between, maybe they haven't, have you given me the power yet to use my clicker again? <laughs> there we go, we'll start here. There was a debate between two of the most ardent Federalists. This was not a partisan fight. This was a fight between two Federalists, and maybe not a fight, a debate between Alexander Hamilton and John Marshall. And that debate was about the extent to which this third branch of government, this unelected branch of government, was going to be strong or weak. And on one side, as Dean Stein said, was Alexander Hamilton. And his quote in Federalist 78 is, the judiciary is weak because it has neither the influence of the sword nor the purse. Now that's the part that we all know. But then there's the end of Federalist 78 where he says, it may truly be said to have neither force nor will, merely judgment. And so one side of this debate between Hamilton and Marshall was that the court actually doesn't have much power, and that's because it can't spend anything and it simply cannot enforce its decisions. Now the other side of that debate comes from our fourth chief justice, that is John Marshall, and he took over the chief justiceship only after others had said no to it. Uh, current chief justice, uh, Oliver Ellsworth was over in France uh, 
wrote to John Adams and said, I can't get back, I'm infirm, and I'll never get back to the United States. Adams offered the position to several others, including former Chief Justice John Jay, who refused to come back, and he finally stuck with John Marshall. The way that I teach about John Marshall, just as an aside, is that Marshall was a very Clinton-esque, Bill, not Hillary, politician. Everybody loved him. He would make the room light up when he came in. Um, and he really was a very, very shrewd politician, as I think history will suggest that Clinton was. But as he gets to be on the court, Marshall sort of strikes back at Hamilton and makes very clear quite quickly in 1803 in Marbury that, in fact, the court is not weak. With the famous phrase that I tell my con law students, they must or should memorize at some point, and that is it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Congress can pass the laws, the executive may enforce them, but we're gonna tell you what the law is if there is any controversy, and we will tell you if those laws are constitutional or not, legitimate or not. Now the interesting thing about this is the question of who is correct. Was it Hamilton in the end or was it Marshall? Now on the side of Hamilton, is that in the early days of the court, nobody thought about the, the, the justices, not the nine, the six. We began with six Supreme Court justices. In fact, there wasn't a Supreme Court. Literally, there was not a building, and we didn't have a building for the nine until 1935. In its first 10 terms, the court heard a total of 50 cases. In its first 18 months, they heard zero cases. Nobody thought about the court, nobody thought it would have much power, and if they thought about it at all, it was simply an afterthought. In other words, Hamilton suggested that the court might not have a lot of power, and history at least, initial history suggested that that might very well be the case. And then you jump ahead to 1832, right towards the end of John Marshall's tenure. He has three years left before his death, and the court decides Worcester versus Georgia. And that's the famous case where in the lore of American history, President Jackson is said to have said, John Marshall has made his decision, let him enforce it. There is almost no evidence that Jackson actually said this, but it's great mythology to tell students and really makes the point of this fight between the executive and the judicial branches. But what we do know is that this is actually what President Jackson meant, and in a letter, to John Coffey, the president said this, almost exactly, but in sort of less angry words, if you will. The decision of the Supreme Court has fell stillborn, and they find they cannot coerce Georgia to yield to its mandate. In other words, they ain't, they ain't got no power. They've got no power, and they're going to yield to Georgia. And this was after years of Marshall trying to build up the court as being a powerful branch. And so on one side, you've got this idea of that Hamilton might have been correct, because at the end of Marshall's tenure, you've got a president that says, we're going to push the court to, to the side. On the other hand, you've got Marshall's entire tenure on the bench. And during his tenure on the bench, he does a number of things. The first I've already told you about. He creates out of whole cloth the power of judicial review. Those two words, judicial review, do not occur in the Constitution. And even though a good number of state Supreme Courts at the time had judicial review, including the two most powerful, Virginia's Supreme Court and Pennsylvania's Supreme Court, the framers did not feel as if it was a power that they were going to document in stone in the Constitution. Yet Marshall, in a case where he accedes to President Jefferson, had he not, it's possible the Jeffersonians were going to try to impeach the Chief Justice for pretty hardcore political reasons, that is, fighting against the Jeffersonian view of democracy. Marshall says, you may win the battle and win this case, Marbury versus Madison, but then I'm going to write an a, a entire screed at the end that suggests from here on out, we get to tell you what the law is. So Marshall lays out judicial review. What else does he do? He upholds that power of judicial review over the states. In two specific cases, Cohen's versus Virginia, which I like very much because it's a case about selling lottery tickets. It's about gambling. You can't go wrong if it's a case about gambling. And a case called Martin versus Hunter's Lessee. That case probably should not have been decided, at least John Marshall should not have been part of the decision, because in fact, 
John Marshall owned some parcel of the land that was in controversy in Martin and Hunter's lessee. He had a clear conflict. He probably should have recused himself. Did he? No. But both of those cases suggest that now not only does the court have the power to say what is the law over Congress and the executive, it now has the same power over the states. The other interesting thing about Martin and Hunter's lessee is it went to the Supreme Court twice. It goes up, the court makes a decision, it comes back down to the state Supreme Court, and the state Supreme Court says, we're not listening to you, and we are not going to follow what you had to say. The case goes back to the Supreme Court, and Marshall's court says, you damn well better listen to us, and made it very clear that Virginia had to follow suit. Third, in a case that you probably, especially if you studied the law at all, would know McCulloch versus Maryland, Marshall makes very clear that the federal government has the absolute authority to create a national bank. That was actually in question. And in McCulloch, not only does this give broad-based economic power to the federal government, but Marshall and his court also said that the states, in this case Maryland, may not turn around as a state and try to tax a federal entity. So it really gives the federal government lots of power, but that power emanates only because Marshall says it does. And you'll note that I keep saying Marshall says it does. I don't say the court says it does. And I'll get back to that in a second. And finally, the Marshall court upholds the right in a case called Dartmouth College versus Woodward, the power to engage in contracts with other private individuals. And while that doesn't seem like it is a it would suggest that the court has power. What it suggests is that the court is making very powerful decisions over very important issues of the day. So it's giving itself power. It's giving itself power over the states. It's, it's allowing national policy, that is the creation of a bank, and now it is having things to say about private contract and telling the government to keep its nose out of that. The point is that, in fact, Marshall made the court powerful. And the question is, how did he make that happen? He ran the court with what I would call a velvet-gloved iron fist. Nobody did anything, that is the other justices, did anything without Marshall's approval. And more than 80% of the decisions handed down by the Marshall court were unanimous. In fact, Marshall would make clear that we would not hand down, they would not hand down a decision until they all agreed. He wanted the court to speak with one voice. And it was much easier for him to do that in that day, just as another aside, I like asides, I love caveats. The justices lived in their home districts, in their home circuits. So when they would come, first to Philadelphia and then to Washington, DC, they all lived together in the same boarding house. They took all of their meals together, and they drank a lot together. And there is very clear evidence that many of the opinions, and several that I talked about here, were written in pubs over mead or beer. <laughs> There's also evidence that McCulloch in Maryland in particular, John Marshall wrote the opinion himself the summer before the court even heard oral argument in that case. <laughs> it was truly the Marshall court. And so my argument tonight is this, that the court has mostly, mostly, been the most powerful branch of government from the inception. And this is difficult for some of my colleagues to take. One of my best friends on the entire face of the earth, although I'm unhappy that he left almost a decade ago now for UNC Chapel Hill from our department, a Congress scholar by the name of Jason Roberts, wants to hit me every time I say the court is more powerful than Congress. I'm right, he's wrong, and he's not here to defend himself. <laughs> And that despite not being able to enforce laws or pass those laws, the court really is powerful. And if you don't like what the court is doing, you might use the word dangerous. To make this claim, I'm going to talk about four court eras that will suggest that in those probably most, four most important eras of the court's history, and today being one of those eras with both Congress and the executive branch melting down in some way, shape, or form, that the Supreme Court is probably all that we have, and love or hate the policy and legal output that it is going to give us, it ultimately ends up being the most powerful of the branches. And so when I say how did Marshall do this, 
the pictures on the end are sort of faded out. They did not have good portraits of these folks. This is the Marshall Court. And I'll show you pictures of the other four court eras, but Marshall and Patterson and Chase and Washington and Moore and Cushing, these were all Federalists. And even after we start getting James Madison putting anti-Federalists on the court, they for the most part fall in line. Remember that statistic. Over 80% of the decisions that emanate from Marshall's court between 1801 and 1935 are unanimous. Okay? So it starts with Marshall running the court in this way. So what are the other eras that I'm going to talk about? I will talk about the New Deal era. That is before 1937. I will then talk about the post-New Deal era. I will move to the Warren Court, and I will finish up the discussion tonight with the Roberts Court, I will almost speak exclusively of the current term, but if, in fact, you have questions about other Roberts Court jurisprudence, I certainly am willing to take those cases, and the, or those questions. And the argument I make about why these are the most powerful of the eras of the court is there, there was a high level of ideological homogeneity that is, there was a majority that could be gotten in any single case, and that is certainly true today, and you can name the five, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, Thomas, Alito, Roberts. And you can name them for each of the other eras, two of them very liberal in the middle, and two very conservative, the first era that I'll talk about and the last era. Okay, so that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to show a little bit of data at the end on the power of judicial review, make some concluding remarks, and then we will, uh, or I will take questions. So let's talk about the, the New Deal era pre-1937. One of my favorite eras of the court to talk about, because the court was controlled by one of the greatest names of a group of people ever to exist, although I'm sure they weren't happy about it, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Justices Butler, McReynolds, Van de Venner, and Sutherland. They were the four most conservative justices on the bench. And with the moderate Republican appointee, Owen Roberts, they struck down almost every single New Deal piece of legislation passed by the democratically controlled Congress and signed by the Democrats sitting in the White House, or as Justice McReynolds liked to call him, no offense to anyone, but it's, hi it's, our, it's history and it's our history, that crippled son of a bitch in the Oval Office. McReynolds had no love for FDR, okay? Well, what did these folks do? What did this court get to do, and how did they stop Chief Justice Hughes and Justice Brandeis and Stone and Cardoza from upholding New Deal legislation. So I'll talk about four areas on how this court put severe limits and put its imprimatur on policy in the United States. Initially in the area of Commerce Clause power, the court severely limited the ability of the FDR administration and Congress together to regulate interstate commerce by first saying in 1935 in a case called Carter versus Carter Coal Company that any regulation on coal and then writ large, any regulation on the production of products is outside the scope of federal power. Because when you're making a product, so the Four Horsemen and Owen Roberts surmised, that product is not part of interstate commerce. And so you basically tell Congress you don't get to regulate production in this case of the coal industry. On the other end of the spectrum, we move from coal to poultry. And in the infamous case, Schechter versus the United States, Schechter Poultry versus the United States, these five also said that once commerce, either coal or poultry or whatever else you can think you would move across state lines, gets across the state line to where it's ending, that stuff can't be regulated either because it's no longer commerce, it is sitting in the state of Minnesota even if it came from West Virginia. So essentially what the four horsemen say is the only place Congress can regulate is when you're actually moving, what the court called the stream of commerce, when you're moving an item. Barring that, everything else is up to the states. 
So severe, severe limits on federal power. Now, how does that make the court powerful? It brought all federal regulation of commerce to a standstill. And despite the fact that there wasn't divided government, either within Congress or within Congress and across to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, they all were hamstrung because the court said, using its power of judicial review, no regulations. Now, it wasn't just commerce. We also know that, in fact, the court said, you also cannot, despite the fact that we're in the midst of a deep depression, help people out with bankruptcy. And so in 1935 as well, in Ashton versus Cameron County District Court, the court, the Supreme Court says, in fact, the Bankruptcy Act, which is a federal law passed to try to help people who are going to lose their homes, is unconstitutional and also falls under the Commerce Clause power. In, that, in essence, we're going to shut down the entirety of the New Deal as much as humanly possible. And this led to FDR's infamous or famous, depending on your point of view, court packing plan, whereby his idea was that any, the number of justices who are sitting on the bench, who have been on the bench for 10 years or longer and are 70 years or older, he would get to put a new justice on the bench. People today are talking about packing the court. He would have gotten to put six new justices on the bench. He was losing every case five to four. You can do the math. He would now, assumedly, win every case 10 to five. Well, what happens is Owen Roberts thinks and thinks and comes to the conclusion in 1937 in the case West Coast Hotel versus Parrish that finally there is a regulation under the commerce power that Congress should have. And when Roberts makes that move to the other ideological coalition, the floodgates open, the New Deal moves forward, we start having the four horsemen retire and or die. I guess not and or, retire or die. <laughs> or and or, retire and then die. And FDR gets to remake the court. But that's very powerful stuff, a technical term, when you're shutting down federal power for as long as the four horsemen with the fifth vote of Owen Roberts did. But what happens next? You get the switch in time, and, and I'm not kidding. The four horsemen start leaving. FDR is tied for the second most nominations in the history of the US Supreme Court. George Washington nominated 14 men to the court, 12 were confirmed. FDR and John Tyler, you never would have thought that. I, I know nothing about the presidency of John Tyler. I do now. He put nine justices on the bench. FDR did as well. Hugo Black in 37, Stan Reed in 38, Bill Douglas in 39, Felix Frankfurter in 1939, Frank Murphy in 40, Harlan Stone in 41, James Byrne in 40, Burns in 41, although he left the court in 42. He was on the court less than 18 months, fewer than 18 months. Robert Jackson in 41, Wiley Rutledge in 1943. Nine appointments. He fully remade the court. And while I, you've got the four horsemen of the apocalypse, you also have the infamous four FDR New Deal cronies, Black, Douglas, Frankfurter, and Jackson, who remake the court as well. And what do they do? They begin, and, and, and this is the makeup of the court circa 1942, 1941. And now you've got a court that had four incredibly staunch conservatives, and you're down to the most conservative justice here being Felix Frankfurter. And he was alleged, probably was, in the 1920s to be a socialist. And suddenly he's the most conservative justice on the bench. I like to commend books. Some of you have heard me commend this book before. You should read a book called Scorpions by Noah Feldman. It is the story of the court in this era and really the story of how Black, Douglas, Frankfurter, and Jackson loved each other because they were all FDR, I'll keep using the word cronies, and by the end of their tenures on the bench, essentially all hated each other. Douglas and Black stayed relatively close, but there was really bad infighting amongst the four of them. So what do these folks do? The pre-New Deal court is slamming the door on federal power. What does this court do? Well. It does the exact opposite. 
gives massive increase in power to the federal government. So it increases protections on the First Amendment. Thornhill versus Alabama, it actually says, oddly enough, for the first time in 1940, that folks, including unions specifically in this case, have the right to strike. You didn't have federal protection prior to Thornhill for the right to strike in the United States. Same year, Cantwell versus Connecticut, you have the right to religious freedom. First time the court speaks specifically on the religious freedom clause of the First Amendment. And in West Virginia versus Barnett in 1943, you finally have the right as a young school child not to have to salute the American flag. So massive increases in First Amendment protections, which really does open up freedoms writ large for citizens of the United States. It goes Again, a technical term, hog wild the opposite way on the Commerce Clause. U.S. versus Darby, and perhaps the most infamous Commerce Clause case of all, Wickard versus Filburn in 1941, the court says that Congress's reach on commerce is so powerful that if you grow wheat on your own land in violation of federal law, even if that wheat is just for your own family's consumption, the government may fine you because we want to regulate how much wheat production goes on in the United States because we regulate prices. And if you are not putting that wheat into the market and keeping it for yourselves, then you're not buying from the market and that'll hurt prices. And one of my favorite students of all time, I can still see him, a young redhead, Keith, I don't remember his last name, sat in the far back of my class and he was so revved up. The only student that I've ever had in my kind of law class was out of his seat yelling with spittle coming out of his mouth, so upset that the court had given Congress that much power over commerce. Because it really was essentially unlimited power to come into your yard, into your home, and regulate what you eat. Okay? What else did these folks do? Increase the federal power, federal government's power in time of crisis. Perhaps beyond Plessy and Ferguson, and Scott versus Sanford, known as the Dred Scott case, Korematsu versus the United States, and Hirabayashi versus the United States in 43 and 44, Hirabayashi in 43, Korematsu in 44. Two of the most infamous black eyes on the court's history, but it was a time of crisis and the court was willing to cede power and give massive increases in power to the federal government to protect us from attack. Okay? And the court has spoken recently, Chief Justice Roberts has spoken in opinions within the last term, term and a half, that Korematsu should no longer be considered good law. But it was the court that said, we have to allow this to happen. Finally, the court begins to give the federal government power over race. And in Shelley versus Kramer, the court bans restrictive covenants that says you can no longer put in contracts for homes that, for the love of God, you cannot sell your home to an African-American family or an African-American person. And in Sweat versus Painter, perhaps one of my top five favorite cases of all time, the court says that the University of Texas Law School may not exclude African-Americans from the law school, and they gave it to Texas, or they gave a choice to Texas, and that was, you may admit African-Americans to your law school, or you may create a black law school that looks exactly the same with the same number of faculty, the same size library, all of the same resources. Take your pick. And when it comes down to the almighty dollar, you all know what Texas did. And suddenly, we have African Americans being integrated into professional schools. And that was one of the middle moves of Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, because what they thought, and they were right, that they would be able to knock down the pins one by one. And you start at the top, maybe we can stomach having African-American and white people go to school together in professional schools. Then we go to college, then we go to high schools, then we go to primary schools. And that's where we get to the next era and that is the Warren Court from 1953 to 1969. And you've got the court lined up, and now again, 
where you had this very staunch conservative hold on the court pre-New Deal. Now you've got President Eisenhower's two biggest mistakes of his entire time in office, as per his own quote, and that is my two biggest mistakes are both on the US Supreme Court, Earl Warren and Bill Brennan. And it's because you had a right-leaning moderate president put on who he thought were two right-leaning moderates and turned out to be two of the foremost liberal justices ever to sit on the US Supreme Court. And so while the Warren court actually stays relatively ideologically conservative through the middle part of the 1950s, you also know what happens in the middle of the 1950s, and that is Brown versus the Board of Education. And so we continue with that post-New Deal era, but this time the focus is not on federal power per se over things like commerce or the economy, but it is a wholesale focus on an increase in our civil liberties and our civil rights. And so you get the court saying that we will continue down the line of Shelley and Painter. And now in Brown 1 and Brown 2, we will say specifically that you have got to integrate schools with that famous phrase, with all deliberate speed, which ultimately allowed many states, most south of the Mason-Dixon, to say deliberate speed means we're gonna move as slow as molasses in January in Minnesota. And so the court then decides in 1958, Aaron versus Cooper, and says, y'all can no longer ignore our decisions. You will begin to enforce them now. Although it's not until 1969, in a case emanating out of Mississippi, where the court finally strikes those words with all deliberate speed and says, you guys are gonna integrate immediately. And that was quite a fight on the bench. Thurgood Marshall wanted that language, and Bill Douglas threatened to write an editorial in the New York Times if, in fact, that phrase was not struck from the court's jurisprudence, and it ultimately was. The court also gives major increases, and this may be what the, what the Warren Court is most well known for beyond Brown, and that is major increase in criminal rights. So in Mapp versus Ohio, a case for those of you who, and I've got an audience unlike my 18 and 19 and 20 year olds who will understand this, a case that involved Don King, the kingpin of the boxing world through the 1980s and early 1990s. Don King was actually involved in Mapp versus Ohio because in fact it was his house that was firebombed and the person who firebombed his house was hiding in Ms. Mapp's house. The police tried to bamboozle her into believing that they were holding a warrant. She would not let them in. They did come back with a warrant. They never found bomb making material, but lo and behold, in the early 1960s, they found, hold your breath, pornography in her basement. And she was arrested and put in jail and convicted for breaking the Ohio pornography laws, obscenity laws. The court creates out of MAP the exclusionary rule that if in fact the police get evidence which is considered fruit of the forbidden tree, it cannot be used in court against you. So now you protect rights of all citizens to be more secure in their homes. Gideon versus Wainwright in 1963. Up until Gideon, you had no right to have an attorney in basically any state of the union unless it was a capital case. Gideon gives everybody the right to have an attorney, even if you want that attorney in traffic court or small claims court. And finally, perhaps most famously, Miranda versus Arizona, 1966. The court says we're gonna protect accused criminals right to due process, and that is you will have your rights read to you. Interesting sidelight on Miranda is that when Justice William Rehnquist got on the court, even after he became chief in 1986, he made it very clear that his, he had many missions when he got on the court. His mission that he cared about the most was overturning Miranda. And in 2000, the case came. Dickerson versus the United States. Rehnquist was in the majority, and as you know, if you are a court geek like I am, when the chief is in the majority, he picks who writes the majority opinion. Rehnquist decided it to himself. And the alarm among the left on the court was heightened, to say the least. Rehnquist could not overturn Miranda. And what he said in that decision was, Miranda has become so inured 
in our psyche, in our social fabric, mostly because of law and order, <laughs> which is on 24-7, that if you start arresting people and not reading them their rights, there's going to be some sort of social upheaval. But the other part of Rehnquist's argument was he believed that Miranda was harming the police, stopping them from being able to get confessions. And what he saw from 1971 when he got on the bench to 29 years later in the year 2000 was that, in fact, Miranda protected the police as much as it protected the criminally accused. Because once you read the Miranda rights, you still can't browbeat somebody, but you can do things like lie to them, get them to confess in, in other ways. And so Rehnquist says, can't overturn it. So huge effect on criminal rights, defendants' rights. This court focuses on the First Amendment, but not on speech. Specifically focuses on freedom of religion and religious establishment. I will commend you Engel versus Vital in 1962, where the court says, no more prayer being read to start public school days. And then in 1963, a year later, in Abington Township versus Shemp, the court says, yes, last year we said no prayer in school. Now you all have to remember that you also can't read Bible verses before school in a public school. And so they are increasing the rights of people to have their religious freedom not tamped down and to increase the wall of separation between church and state. Finally, and perhaps most infamously, this court, and I debated on what word I should use here, but created is probably the right word. The word privacy is not in the Constitution. It's not in the Bill of Rights. It's not in any of the other 17 amendments. Yet in Griswold, Bill Douglas writes the opinion and says, you find the right to privacy in the penumbras or the gray areas of the Constitution in the First Amendment right to freedom to associate with whomever you would like to associate, in the Third Amendment right that you do not have to quarter soldiers, that is, your home is your castle, in the Fourth Amendment right to be protected from illegal searches and seizures in your castle, to the Fifth Amendment right that you've got the right to due process, and finally, in the Ninth Amendment that nobody reads, that says this, not verbatim, just because we gave you all these rights in the first eight amendments doesn't mean you don't have others. So one, three, four, five, and nine, Douglas says, you have the right to privacy. Specifically, the right to privacy as a married couple to buy and use contraception. Oddly enough, that case only dealt with married couples' right to use contraception. It wasn't until a couple of years later in Eisenstadt versus Baird that single people got the right. And what the court knew in, in creating this right to privacy, again, like Marshall did with judicial review out of whole cloth, they knew that they were on a collision course, not with that wall, but with a woman's right to choose abortion on demand. And they knew those cases were percolating, they knew they were coming, and they knew as initially with nine old white men and then ultimately with nine, eight old white and one old African-American man that they were going to need to deal with that right. But you've got the Warren court that at its apex changed everything about law and rights in the United States. And then Warren leaves to run the Warren Commission. Abe Fortas gets caught in a Merrick Garland situation and doesn't get to become Chief Justice, and ultimately, because of his scandals, he leaves. And we move into what was going to be the conservative revolution. Nixon gets four appointees. Blackman, Berger, Rehnquist, Powell. And the liberal revolution is dead, but it, that conservative counter-revolution never really materialized. And when Rehnquist took over after the 85 term, we certainly did get a hardcore shift to the right. And until the past five or six years, I would still use the phrase in my judicial process courses and my con law, con law courses to say that that was the single most conservative court we, has, we have probably ever had. And that would include the Roger Tawney court that decided the Dred Scott case. That would include the economically conservative courts of the late 1800s and early 1900s that said the federal government needs to keep its nose out of all matters economic. And it also includes the court with the four horsemen. But then Roberts took over. 
And initially, Roberts sort of softened the view. Rehnquist was prickly and difficult, although all his colleagues loved him. But he really had an agenda, and Roberts claims in, in his 05 confirmation hearings, I come with no agenda. There's no partisanship. There's no ideology. That turns out, now that he has a very strong five-person majority, probably not to be true. And so the last era is the Roberts Court of 2019, and this is it. You have the four on the left, Kagan, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and then the five, Kavanaugh, although that doesn't look, I can see it on my screen, he's, he's blotted out here, Kavanaugh, Thomas, <laughs> Roberts, and Gorsuch. I got the, these are, these are actually pictures that come off of the website that some of you have heard me talk about before, oye.org, O-Y-E-Z. You can listen to oral arguments, you can read opinions, and then you can see how the justices voted and sort them by ideology. And those who end up being blurred out a little bit are those who were in dissent in a particular case. And so I, I had to choose one side or the other, and I ultimately ended up with the five being uh, a little lighter than, than the other four. But now we've got a court where Justice Thomas was put on by Bush 41, the Chief Justice and Sam Alito were put on by Bush 43, Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh were put on by Trump, Ginsburg and Breyer put on the court by Clinton, and Sotomayor and Kagan put on the court by Obama. It could be a five-person left-leaning majority. Let's be very clear, though. Merrick Garland would have been more liberal than Kavanaugh or Gorsuch. Merrick Garland is not a liberal. He's a left-leaning moderate, although that would have made a world of difference, to be perfectly honest, ideologically. I'm not going to talk about all of the Roberts Court, as I said. Let me talk about what we have coming up and why this court is going to change us in a pretty hardcore 90-degree turn to the right, like the Warren Court turned us very hardcore to the left. And I'll just pick a few cases to talk about. June Medical Services versus Gee is a reinterpretation of whole women's health, this time in Louisiana and not Texas. It is the exact same case. That is, doctors who work at abortion clinics must have admitting privileges to the nearest hospital, and any clinic that performs abortions must have all of the same features as a hospital, the same wide hallways, all the same equipment, everything. There's every reason to believe that this is the case that will not it could, if you really read the caustic left-wing literature, overturn Roe versus Wade, but will severely limit that right. Because Roe is not the law of the land, Planned Parenthood versus Casey is, and the law of the land is the idea of undue burden. And this court will probably say that those regulations in Louisiana are not an undue burden on women in any way, shape, or form. So you're going to see, see a severe decrease in a woman's right to choose. There will be restrictions on criminal rights. The court heard during its first day of arguments on what should be a national holiday three days ago, Kaler versus Kansas, where the court is considering and most likely will decide that states may get rid of the insanity defense if they would like to, no longer need to offer that as a defense in criminal cases. In Ramos versus Louisiana, another case from Louisiana, the court is probably going to say that you do not, or that you do need to have unanimous, or you do not need to have unanimous verdicts in criminal cases, make it a little easier to convict. And finally, in the case involving the DC sniper, for those of you who remember the DC sniper uh, incident, 2002-ish, uh, young Lee Malvo, who was underage at the time, he was 16, I believe, was put in jail for life without parole. And the argument that he and his attorney are making now is if, in fact, as the court said in Roper versus Simmons, you cannot put to death people who commit murder prior to being 18, you simply also shouldn't be able to put them in jail without the possibility of parole because that's the same as a death sentence. The court is going to probably re, uh, increase restrictions on equal protection. New York, or in, I'm sorry, in Bostick versus EEOC, Altitude versus Zara. And Harris Funeral Homes, which is the transgender case, the court is deciding and heard arguments two days ago on whether or not the Title VII protection of sex as a protected class also applies to sexual orientation and to transgender people. Oddly enough, 
The swing vote in this case is probably not the chief. If you listened, or well, you wouldn't listen yet, if you read the transcript of oral argument or anything about oral argument from Tuesday, it was Justice Gorsuch who was very concerned about what the social upheaval would look like if we suddenly say in 2019, we are no longer protecting homosexuals. Now, he didn't ask the same question in the transgender case, but he seems as though he might be leaning to say we can't go too far too fast in decreasing those equal protection rights. The court is going to increase Second Amendment rights. I think that this is probably a throwaway case. New York City has a law which, in fact, it has already rescinded, which said specifically, you cannot leave your home in New York City with a gun unless, A, it is not loaded, and B, you are going only to one place, and that is a shooting range within the city limits of New York. Other than that, you can't bring a handgun with you. Not going to pass muster on this court. The court argued that this case is not moot, and it should, if, should actually no longer be a case. It should be moot, M-O-O-T, because the law no longer exists. The justices decided last Friday that's not the case. They're going to hear it, and I think they're going to put another hammer in the, the, the board that suggests we protect Second Amendment rights more strongly. And finally, the court is probably going to decrease the wall of separation between church and state. Espinoza versus Montana Department of Revenue. The argument is that the state of Montana, like many states, will give state funding to private schools, but not to private parochial schools. And the parochial schools say, if you're going to give money to private schools, you got to give money to all private schools. Well, that is a pretty severe or pretty difficult discussion of separation of church and state. The court has shown every reason to believe although they haven't even set this case for oral argument yet, that in fact they will probably side with Espinoza and not with the Department of Revenue in Montana. So you're going to see, just as you had massive increase in rights during the Warren Court era, you're going to see a retraction of rights and a retraction of government involvement and regulation in this court. Roberts finally has the votes to do so. And there's no reason to believe that in fact he would act as chief or the four who are in his ideological coalition would act any differently than the majority coalitions in the other eras that I've talked about. So what does this all mean? What do all these eras have in common? First, they've, as I said, they've got a clear ideological majority. And I've already said this, but other examples include the Tawny Court from 1836 to 1864, the late 1800s court, and the Rehnquist Court of the early 1990s. These courts have decided, in all of these eras, large numbers of highly salient cases that affect our social, economic, and political systems and culture. And they've used their majorities to make those changes in whatever direction they feel fit. And these courts have stayed together for a very long period of time. My students at 18 and 19 and 20 years old are aghast when I say to them, when you're when you are 60 years old, Justice Kavanaugh is probably still on the bench. And that's the way the court works. You stay on the court, and folks are getting on it younger, staying longer, and these courts are staying together. And whether you like the decisions or not, that's how the court is playing, and that's where it draws its power. And these courts regularly invoke judicial review. I will end with some data. And while I don't have data, Prior to 1940, the y-axis tells you the number of decla laws declared unconstitutional in any given term. The x-axis, the horizontal axis, is year. You can clearly see the Warren Court era in the, night, the mid to late 1960s. You can see the Rehnquist Court era in the late 80s, in the early 90s. And you can see the uptick in declarations of unconstitutionality in the early to mid Roberts Court. And those are courts with eras where they have these strong ideological majorities to do whatever they want, which suggests the court is quite powerful. So in the end, <laughs> and I will not sing any Hamilton songs. <laughs> it would not be wise. But he was right. While it is emphatically the province of the judiciary to say what is law, that suggests a high level of power for the judiciary, and in particular, the United States Supreme Court. And this is not new. Hamilton was wrong from the start. 
Hamilton was incredibly smart, probably should have been president, died too young, but he was wrong in Federalist 78 about the judiciary. It is incredibly strong and will remain incredibly strong for time to come. Also note, the center is gone. There are no more suitors, Powells, O'Connors, Stewarts, Whites. We are an ideologically polarized court, and, and whichever side can garner the majority will be the powerful for a decade, two decades, three decades, three and a half decades. And finally, the court's going to remain in its conservative term, turn, unless they do one of two things, win the White House or the Senate or both. And I do not make public predictions, and despite the fact that this is being recorded, I will deny that it's my voice saying this, but I will tell you this. <laughs> my one prediction is that if President Trump wins re-election, but the Democrats win the Senate, Justice Thomas will resign probably the day after the 2020 election. Maybe a week. And that will give President Trump and Senator McConnell two months of a lame duck Congress, or a month and a half of a lame duck Congress, to put a much younger Justice Thomas on the bench. And the court will remain as a very powerful, very conservative majority for decades to come. Thanks for your time. I will take any questions you've got. Very fascinating. I see hands going up all over the place. Before we start asking questions, uh, just let me remind you, it's a moderated uh, conversation we have, so we'll get a microphone to you. Um, we are recording this for a podcast that we'll be uh, doing, so uh, one of the things I ask you, and I always ask this, please keep your questions brief so we can get to as many questions as possible. So, uh, Vivian, we'll start with you right there in the middle. And I'm also going to ask people if they can because we are recording, hold the microphone a little bit to the side and about a fist away from your... Thank you. Yes, sir. Let's see if this is going to work. Yes, it does. My scenario is, uh, let's say one of our justices, and let's say perhaps it's Ginsburg, uh, has a catastrophic health event. Uh -huh. Let's say it's a stroke. Uh -huh. Is incapacitated and can't make a decision. Yep. Can't retire from the bench. What's the procedure? Nothing. She's there until she resigns or dies. Period, end of story. Thurgood Marshall was famous for having said, if I die, he said this to his clerks, put me on a two-wheel dolly and bring me to oral argument and just sit <laughs> me in my seat. But no, this happened to both Black and Douglas in the early 70s. They were infirm day in and day out for months. In fact, well over a year, they were in the hospital together, several rooms away from each other. You can't do anything about it. They have to resign. You cannot impeach someone for having bad health. Good okay, question, though. Great. Question over here to the left. I think from what you've discussed so far that the um, most reasonable answer to this entire conundrum that we're under, or for those of us who oppose the conservative movement in this country, is if we can get the presidency and the Senate, two very large ifs, that we expand the court to 15 members. Not from nine to 11, but to 15. 11 would be okay, but it is absolutely essential, unless we are gonna write off the next three uh, decades, uh, and we are going to see yeah, I get a, supreme, it. Yep. a Supreme Court that is decidedly different than the populace of the United States, as I understand it today. Sure. Isn't that the only answer? So I, I will disagree with you. I think it's a fundamentally terrible idea. And the reason that it is, is that when you make decisions like that, it always comes back. I apologize I, for my technical terms. It always comes back to bite you in the ass. <laughs> it was the Republicans that term limited presidents. It was the Republicans who ultimately wanted desperately for President Reagan to run for a third term and then said, oh my God, he can't do it because we passed the amendment to the Constitution that said we can't. So fine, 
you're living in a world where you don't like what the court is doing policy-wise, and there are many people who believe that. But 50 years from now, when your great-grandkids or your great-great-grandkids have a court that's incredibly liberal that now has 15 justices, and the Republicans, or whatever party it would be, takes over the Senate, takes over the presidency, they now go to 21. The Ninth Circuit, technical term again, sucks because it's got 27 justices or judges on it. Now, they, don't, they almost never hear a case on bank with all 27. In fact, even when they go to on bank review, meaning more than a three-judge panel, they do that in panels of nine because it's too unwieldy. 15, probably too unwieldy. You're getting to scary levels when you get to 21. How many of you, of you all have sat on committees? I know the two, the two or three deans here have. And you get a committee with any more than seven, eight, nine people, and it's terrible. The decision making goes awry. And the collegiality that is what rules the court, that number, Gesundheit, that Justice Brennan was so famous for saying, the only thing that matters on the court is the number five. You and four of your colleagues agreeing. Now that number ends up being at 15, that, that special number is eight. It's a whole lot harder to convince eight than it is to four. I don't think it's a bad idea. You don't know what my ideology is. I don't, I'm not going to tell you it's a bad idea ideologically, because I think that that is a strategy the Democrats could and probably will follow. I think it is a bad precedent to set, because it will come back to bite them the same way that term limits on presidents did. So from a purely practical standpoint, you get into very dangerous territory pretty quickly. But your point is well taken ideologically. OK, another one here in the middle. Uh, address the federal courts over and above the, the Supreme Court. And the, in my view, the marginal quality of the number of, large number of appointees that McConnell has brought into the federal court system. Yeah, so I will say this. The, the vetting process of the Trump administration is the worst of any administration in current memory, mostly for the lower courts. And they are also doing, the Senate is also doing what has been done very little in the past. I actually have a research paper with uh, uh, one of my colleagues who many of you would know, Catherine Pearson. She's on the news all the time, and she's always speaking at events like this, and one of my graduate students. And we're analyzing circuit and district court nominees who end up coming in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee in groups instead of as individuals. So a colleague of mine who is now in the Eighth Circuit, uh, Judge David Strauss, who was in our law school for some time, he, did, he was at his confirmation hearings with another nominee who was one of the folks you're talking about that was well below standard. So Judge Strauss, he was already a judge on the state Supreme Court, is sitting here and is asked like two and a half questions because he was and is eminently qualified, whatever his ideology is, to sit on the court. The other gentleman was not qualified probably in any way, shape, or form, and the Judiciary Committee just went after him. So now you're not even getting to talk to one of these folks, and sometimes they have three, four, and five on these panels. The Trump administration is simply not vetting folks in the way that Obama, Bush, Clinton, Bush, Reagan, all the way back, right, name them all the way back, vetted their nominees. And that is leading to some problems in the lower courts and will lead to more problems. What they are doing is, is the, the bigger impact than, than the Supremes, although they set federal law in all these salient cases, the bigger problem is at the district and circuit court level because that's where all the game is played. Now, yes, people can ask short questions. I never give short answers. And some of my former students know this. The game is all played at the district court level and the circuit court level. Why? At the district court level, there is in any given year about 750,000 cases percolating around our trial, federal trial courts. Only about 10% or 75,000 of those cases go to the circuit courts. What do the Supremes decide today? About 75 cases. Do the math in your head. You have a 0% probability of getting your case to the court, or it approaches zero mathematically. And so those are the folks who might not be as qualified who are making decisions that actually set most of the precedent in the United States. So address it. It's a big problem. It is a big problem and will continue to be. OK, we have one way back in the corner there, Anastasia. Actually, I have two questions. I'll ask them briefly. One is, if I have a right to bear arms, why can't I have a bazooka? Uh, if, so, if the government comes after me, they're going to come in a tank. I need a bazooka. Yeah, so let me answer that one first. 
Justice Scalia says in Heller versus DC that absolutely you have an individual right to bear arms, and that is what really upset the left quite a bit, right? You now have this individual right, and it's unclear whether the Second Amendment says that. But even Justice Scalia, who was the, uh, uh, the most horrible person for the left in the world, leaves the door open and says that just because you've got an individual right doesn't mean the government might not be able to have reasonable regulations. And I guarantee you this, a bazooka case goes to the Supreme Court, and Justice Scalia is still alive, he votes to say regulating bazookas is legitimate. So you might have the right to carry a, I don't know much about guns, a Glock. You might have the right, my uncle is a hunter, you've got the right to hold long arms when you go hunting. But there are certain guns that, that even the most conservative court you can think of is not going to allow you to carry. And those cases will come. What's your second question? The second question is, as it is now with the electoral college system, uh, when you carry the state, you get all of the votes. Yep. Why can't I, in a state that goes 49 to 51, if I'm on the 49th state, why don't I have a right to get electors to report to me? Why don't those electors be divided amongst those two divides? Excellent question, because state legislatures make all those decisions. If you look at the Constitution, the time, place, and manner of elections is set by state legislatures. So states could do that. States could absolutely say, we're going to do... Um, proportional representation, we're going to follow the um, federal returns. And so if Hillary Clinton does get more votes than, than Donald Trump, then she gets all of our votes. They can make the decision in any way they want, but it is not a federal issue and it never will be. It'll always be a state issue, state by state. Okay, Tim, I have one over here. I just read about um, lawyers going before the Supreme Court yeah. now get two minutes, yeah. and they used to be grilled beforehand. Could you tell us about that? Because yeah. what, what does the lawyer do if they can't talk? So, <laughs> you mean if they don't under, if they don't, if they don't, are you saying if they don't have enough to say? Okay, I, then I know what you meant. Yeah. So I've, I've spent my career studying the court's oral argument. So we've taken theories of social science. We've gathered large amounts of data. In fact, we've gathered data on every question asked by every justice for the past 40, well, uh, I can't do math, back to 1953, so 66 years. We know every question. We have run all of these questions through all sorts of different software, linguistic software, so we know the emotional content. We know whether they're asking nice questions or zinger questions. We know how they're treating, therefore, each side. Because we have, now we've got some sort of gauge, statistically, of it, it, whether one attorney is being treated better than the other. Well, what we do know is that the justices control oral argument. This is going to be a relatively long answer. <laughs> Prior to 1850, litigants did not file briefs at the court. Everything was done in the old English common law style. That is, everything was done orally. So Daniel Webster, when he would go to the court, court would come in session at 8 a.m. He would argue from 8 a.m. till noon. They'd take an hour-long lunch. He would argue from 1 to 5, and he wasn't done. So they'd go home to bed and have dinner, have a few drinks. He'd come back and argue from 8 till noon. He's argued for 12 hours now, and then his opponent gets to argue. And the justices almost never asked any questions because they wanted to listen to the oration. Maybe they'd fall asleep. So they could understand the case. Now that the justices have thousands of pages of briefs from the litigants, interest groups. Now they want to suss out those arguments. So Thurgood Marshall argues, Brown v. the Board of Education, argues for 60 minutes. The justices spoke 127 times during his argument. Do the math. That's easy. That's more than twice a minute the justices were interrupting him. So what do you do as an attorney? Prior to this rule change, which only took effect four cases ago, it took effect on Monday, you would say, Mr. Chief Justice and may it please the court, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg would say, um, I've got a question. Actually, she would. And I was at oral argument last December, so I mean this sincerely. Ruth Bader Ginsburg sits at oral argument like this. <laughs> But she, and that's because her back is bad, and she's also reading briefs, and it was phenomenal to watch her do this. She sort of sat up as straight as she could. She opens up her brief, and she says, I got to ask you about page 86. Your argument is bad. And then goes off on the attorney in a very nice fashion. Or you had John Paul Stevens in his bow tie, and he was always very nice. He would say, ahem, ahem. excuse me, may I ask you a question? Well, for the love of God, yes, you can. You're the justice. She's the attorney. You can ask her a question. But they control 
And I think they believed it got out of control. And if you ask Justice Thomas in particular, he really believes they've gotten out of control. His argument for why he doesn't ask questions is he fundamentally, and I've talked to him about this, he fundamentally believes it's unfair to the attorneys. So what do they do? They change the rules. They give you two minutes to make your case. So what's going to happen? I actually just was emailing with a colleague of mine from Northwestern. We're going to study this, but we can't write a paper yet because there's no data. We only have data from four cases. We need data probably from the entire term. So it's going to be this interesting thing. And I, and I think John knows this, right, that you don't want to be scooped by somebody. And so we're going we're gonna to walk this fine line of not wanting our findings to be scooped, but we've got to wait to get the data. What's going to happen is you're going to get two minutes of a very, very short soliloquy, and then the knives are going to come out. It's just going to be ratcheted to 58 minutes instead of 60. Okay, we'll great. see. Another question here in the middle. The House is working on articles of impeachment. Yeah. If it passes, I understand the Senate does not have to take it up. Question. Can the House go directly to the Supreme Court and say, decide yes or no, nope. the Senate has to take it up? No, nope. and the Senate, and, and Senator McConnell has said that they will have to. The Constitution mandates that if impeachment, if a president is impeached that is indicted, that the Senate has to take it up. They will take it up. And there's going to be, I mean, we've never seen this, so maybe they could ask the court to force the Senate to do it. It won't happen. Okay, way back in the corner. Hi. Um, I feel a little bit like your redheaded student that might spittle. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. I was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about the blue slip process uh -huh. and how that has been completely upended and ignored by Senator McConnell and kind of yep. what your thoughts are around that. Yeah, so let me be clear first what a blue slip is. Blue slips have nothing to do with Supreme Court nominees. They mostly have to do with U.S. District Court nominees, sometimes Circuit Court nominees. And what they are is this. You actually have a process, which is a norm, not a rule in Congress, of senatorial courtesy. And so if the president wants to nominate someone to the U.S. District Court in Minnesota, he wants to get the a, a specific advice and consent and assent of the senators. Now, generally, that doesn't work across party lines. It has in the past. There's no shot that President Trump would ask Senator Klobuchar or Senator Smith for, uh, for their approval. They would try to blue slip, which would mean stop that nomination. It is not Senator McConnell that got rid of blue slipping. That was ended when we had nuclear option all the way back in 2005 by the Democrats and the infighting between the Democrats and the Republicans back then when the Democrats were in the majority really shot that all to hell. And now what happens? It comes back to bite the Democrats because now McConnell can use it. And I will say this, there are two of the best politicians in Washington, D.C. today that we have ever had. One is Mitch McConnell. What he did to Merrick Garland, you might hate what he did. It was one of the most brilliant political moves you would ever see because he had nothing to lose. If Hillary Clinton won, then she's, I mean, Hillary Clinton's not a liberal. She was just going to put a moderate like Merrick Garland on the court anyway. But if Trump won, then McConnell wins the billion dollar lottery, and he did. The second is Nancy Pelosi. And I fight with our 24-year-old about this on a regular basis. God, I can't stand Nancy Pelosi, and the 24-year-old knows everything. <laughs> she is the most savvy, brilliant politician in that capital, in our capital right now. And people say, why did she finally say she's going to go forward with impeachment? Because she wasn't going forward unless, A, she had the moderates, and B, she actually had the evidence. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to happen or that he'll be convicted, but she's got what she thinks she needs to finally get the president. And she is good enough to have waited to make that happen. So that's more than you wanted about blue slips. <laughs> but yes, absolutely, McConnell is using it to his advantage. He wasn't the first. OK, again, here in the middle. Let's explore uh, some of the presumptions under which Justice Roberts operates. Uh -huh. Right now, uh, the House is at loggerheads with the executive. Right. A case emerges, goes to the Supreme Court. Uh, you can start out presuming four versus four, and then it's, perhaps it's up to John Roberts. Sure. On the one hand, um, he is very loath, I understand, to be perceived as a third house of the legislature yep. and in any way partisan. So presumably he punts. Um, and uh, then it goes back to where we are right now. And you know, we remain with the president. 
or perhaps John Roberts is an overwhelming institutionalist and he is really motivated to preserve the institutions that he sees being attacked yep. and so he takes a position in which case um, those of us who are not comfortable the way things are going win. Um, so those are two different outcomes but which way do you think that would go? You're gonna hate, you're gonna hate me for this. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> why, right, so why does Roberts do what he does in the ACA cases? That was an institutional legitimacy venture for him. He does not expand Congress's commerce power as the post-New Deal court did. In fact, he closes the door on it and says commerce does not, the commerce power or the power of interstate commerce doesn't extend to forcing people to buy things. It might extend, as it did in Wickard and Filburn that I talked about, that, that, the, that Congress can regulate what you eat but not what you buy. I mean, that's sort of a bizarre distinction, but that's the distinction he makes. Another aside, I'm sitting, and this isn't to make myself look cool or anything, it makes me look probably even geekier than I am. I'm sitting in the NPR studios with Carrie Miller. And that decision comes down and there's a like 90,000 inch TV behind me. And she sees the scroll and the scroll says, oh my God, Obamacare is dead. And I turn around and it's CNN, Obamacare is dead. So I get on my computer, Fox News, Obamacare dead. MSNBC, Obamacare dead. And then I click on the decision and he says, no commerce clause but dot, 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 and you turn the page and he says taxation power. Very narrow decision, that is typical John Roberts. The reason my answer isn't fully jerky by saying it depends, that you're gonna get Roberts to be that fifth vote in a decent number of cases where he will be that fifth vote, that Kennedy vote, but they're gonna be in cases that are less consequential, but they're gonna give him the political or legal capital now in the cases that are highly salient that he cares about to go with the other side, his side, the, the ideologically conservative side, and he can say, it ain't partisan. I've gone with the liberals in all of these cases. It's also a very shrewd, it, it will be a shrewd move. And again, I don't make public predictions, but that's how I think it's gonna go. He'll go with the left on cases that we can say, all right, He's being fair, and then boom, he's going to decide the way he does in the Louisiana abortion case. So that's, I think, how he's going to play it. And if you read Joan Biskupic's uh, biography of him, which just came out a couple of months ago, and I'm in the middle of reviewing, this is how it's going to play. He is not the nonpartisan person that he portrays publicly. He has very strident views, but he is also smart enough to know and institutionalist enough to know that he can't be that strident all the time. Because the institution really does matter, does matter to him. He was not going to be, last thing I'll say about the ACA cases, he was not going to be the chief justice that killed the ACA. Right, what do we say about Roger Tawney, Dred Scott? What do we say about the Waite Court, I think it's the Waite Court, Plessy versus Ferguson, right? What do we say about the Stone Court, Korematsu? We did not, he did not want to be the Roberts court that killed people's health care. Because that, he would never have lived that down. Okay, Anastasia has one back here. Um, like the last uh, judicial review when they had Brett Kavanaugh come back onto the court, are you seeing that he, um, are you seeing that that process of him being like heard by everybody and interviewed um, that whole interrogation and hearing process, are you thinking that that's going to then be demonstrated and then done by Republicans to Democratic candidates for um, judicial reviews? And in the future, do you think that that backfired on them by them doing that to him? Or oh, so you mean that? in the confirmation process when yeah, they brought like, on Dr. Blasey Ford? Basically, are you seeing that that's going to be more of a political standpoint and like a way to like rebuke the people that are coming onto the courts? Are you seeing that to be more? I think that if there is scandal, I think that's a very good question. Very good question if they can find that sort of scandal, right? It is very clear that something happened. We don't know what happened, but the evidence suggests that something happened and there are more women who came forward. You cannot just gin up people coming forward. So my, my answer is, yeah, the Republicans are gonna give Democratic nominees a harder time in the future unless we break the partisan divide that we are in, but only if they can find dirt on somebody, right? You have to find the dirt in order to make that happen. And if the Democrats or the Republicans going forward 
are putting up nominees who are very clean, if you will, for lack of a better term, then they'll just get them on policy, or they'll go after them on policy grounds. But it's a very fair question. Okay, Tim, I have one right here. I believe you mentioned, I think it was White versus the West Virginia Board of Education in Barnett, right. Barnett? Yeah, in 43. During yeah. 43, yeah. yeah. That was a, a six to three decision yeah. that said no person, regardless of position, can say how the uh, Pledge of Allegiance could be addri yeah, right. addressed. Yeah. And subsequently, several other lower courts have expanded that to the national anthem. Right. But yet, when we have a kid put in the hospital with a traumatic brain injury and certain people complaining about people taking a knee, nobody says anything, nobody does anything. May I have your comment? Uh, I mean, you know, Colin Kaepernick can certainly sue the NFL. And it would be well within his rights, but the NFL is a private business. It's not a governmental entity. Let's be very clear about this. You only have a First Amendment right against federal government encroachment. Now it's been incorporated state government encroachment on your free speech rights. Congress shall pass no law. It doesn't say the NFL shall pass no law, or that private school X, Y, or Z shall pass no law, or that whatever business you work for shall pass no law. Certainly you can't be discriminated on based on your race, color, religion, sex, sex. we'll see whether that leads to sexual orientation as well, but private companies like the NFL private businesses are welcome to do that. There is no free speech right. So yes, we scream and holler about someone like Colin Kaepernick. The NFL is well within its rights to do it. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay, what, we have one in the, clear in the back there. Yeah, do you think uh, that there's ever a possibility of uh, imposing term limits on justices, and what do you think of that? Yeah, so I, I, you know, I mean, we could certainly go for the 18-year terms, or we could do the term limits like we have in Minnesota. What I think about it is it's never going to happen. And the reason it's not is to do, you need a constitutional amendment, and it is a very, very difficult process, right? You need two-thirds of both houses, and then you need three. To, to propose and pass, and then you need three quarters of the state legislatures or state constitutional conventions to ratify. The ERA never got ratified. I mean, we don't ratify amendments to the, oh, it did recently, right? I mean, it finally passed even after the deadlines. But we don't pass constitutional amendments. And the framers meant that for a reason. They wanted it very difficult to change the document because they didn't want the partisan bickering that we have to make the country go up and down like a yo-yo. And so it may be a good idea, and we've seen it work well in states, although I think that Justice Page probably should have been able to stay on the bench. The guy's mind is brilliant. But it has worked relatively well in Minnesota, and maybe it would work at the federal level, but it ain't gonna happen. As an aside, Justice Page's, one of his closest friends and allies in the court was my friend who I talked about before, Justice David Strauss. And Justice Strauss is as conservative as they come. He clerked for Clarence Thomas. And we know that Alan Page was probably the most left-leaning justice on the bench. They wrote together on a regular basis in dissent and concurrence and majority opinions because they had specific beliefs that they had in common about the law and where the law should go. Okay, question over here. I've said the, the court has no power of enforcement, but sure. uh, in a case, say, where they might rule that the Trump administration has to hand over certain documents and the executive stiffs them, who enforces that? So, so my students asked me this today because we read and discussed U.S. versus Nixon today. And again, don't quote me on this. And I had an argument on the phone on my drive home with one of my former graduate students, and she vehemently disagrees with me. But I believe that if there are tapes and there are documents, and they are withheld, that the court will decide 9-0 to force his hand to turn them over. Now, who will enforce it? It's unclear. Who will have the enforcement mechanism? But what I do know is that if, in fact, the court decides 9-0 that he has to turn over the documents and he doesn't, the House impeaches almost immediately and the Senate convicts. Because this court, that, and, and it's actually not an ideological argument, this court, the five right-leaning members of the court, this isn't about their ideology. These five gentlemen love executive power, but they don't love it that much. 
And if you have a president that fundamentally breaks down all of the separation of powers and checks and balances, they're not going to stand for it, and neither will Congress. Now, will that ever happen? I don't know. And again, I'm not going to really make the prediction. I'm just giving the scenario. But that's probably how it would play out. And no one's going to stand for it. OK. Tim, well, we have just a few minutes. Can, sure. you, can you talk about your SCOTUS notes project? Sure. So some of you have heard about this project. Um, The court's decision-making process has been studied ad nauseum by folks in my subfield, in my field of study, which is I study nine justices. And if you go back in time, I probably study 27 people historically. Because we don't do much studying of the court pre-World War II data just don't exist. The one part of the court's decision-making process that nobody has been able to analyze is the court's private conference. Why? Because it's private. I like to say it, and it's a complete misnomer, but it sounds good. It's probably the most secret meeting that happens in DC, except for the NSA meetings. <laughs> there are no clerks allowed, no secretaries allowed, no police officers, no marshals, nobody, just the nine. And there is no official record of those meetings. But it turns out that a whole host of justices during those meetings took notes about what each of their colleagues said. And then they left their papers at various repositories around the country, most at the Library of Congress, Justices Blackman, Brennan, Warren, Jackson, White, Marshall, Douglas, Black, all at the Library of Congress. Justice Powell's are very rich. They're at uh, Washington and Lee University Law School. We got a big grant from the National Science Foundation. A colleague of mine and I, his name is Ryan Black at Michigan State University. Google him. He's a very interesting guy. And I'm very proud because he was one of my undergraduates here in CLA at the University of Minnesota. He's a full professor now at Michigan State University. I feel old. <laughs> we sent a cadre of research assistants two and a half years ago now. And they digitized it to digital pictures of damn near 50,000 pages of these notes. The problem is, is the justices have really horrible handwriting. <laughs> the other problem is, is how do you then analyze that when nobody reads cursive anymore? My five-year-old, or five, oh god, he'd kill me. Our 14-year-old <laughs> doesn't even have a signature and never will, because they stopped teaching cursive before he got to, to fourth grade. I think he had like one semester of cursive. So we actually, no offense to the, to the people of age in this room, but we actually thought of starting to go to communities where older folks live and asking you all, because you can at least read cursive. <laughs> that would have taken forever. There is a group here at the University of Minnesota that is combined with the Adler Planetarium in Chicago and Oxford University. It is a group called Zooniverse. Universe, but it's Z-O-O -O at the start, zooniverse.org. Go to their website. It is a crowdsourcing website. They use what they call citizen scientists to collect data on all sorts of things from bi the biological sciences to the humanities, now to the social sciences. And they were delighted when they heard what we wanted to do. We wanted to transcribe and decode these notes. We gathered all the data. They created a platform for us, which is on a website called SCOTUS, as in Supreme Court of the United States, scotusnotes.org. You can, as a citizen scientist, be one of the, and I am, I, I'm absolutely serious about this, the 1.8 million volunteers that go on to the Zooniverse website every year now to help as citizen scientists as volunteers and help us transcribe the justices' notes. And so we have notes all the way back to 1937. Right now, we are focusing just on Justices Brennan, Powell, and Blackman. That is the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and early 90s to get a sense of the discussion the justices have in these private conversations and how those private conversations lead to the ultimate opinions that the court writes, not only in highly salient cases, but in every case that they decide. So it's a massive undertaking. It's still going to take us several years, but we could use all the help we could get. So volunteer for us, please. Not to mention the notes about the baseball yes. game and sure. falling asleep. Wake up, Harry. Right. So yes. we, I mean, look, on my website, if you Google Timothy R. Johnson, I'm the first person to come up on Google. I did not pay Google for that. Uh, just add my initial in there. And you can find notes that the justices pass to each other at oral arguments. They're phenomenal, fascinating, and funny. I just made that up. 
You can also see the notes that Justices Blackman and Powell took during oral argument while the attorneys were arguing, so you can get into their minds and see what they were seeing as the attorneys stood at the lectern. All right, great. So before we take our last question, I um, want to remind you we'll be doing this again next month on November 7th. Uh, we're having Dr. Francis Shen come. He's an associate professor of law and a faculty member in the graduate program in neuroscience. Uh, Dr. Shin is going to be uh, discussing a fascinating, relatively new field of neuro law, which explores the intersection between advances in neuroscience and how that's applied to legal rules, standards, and personal culpability. So it'll be quite interesting. I, uh, my really simple definition of some of that is, are we really responsible for what we do? Depending you, on what's going on in our brains. You absolutely have to come back for it. Francis is spectacular. Yes. So, and, okay. and, so and, we'll do one last so, question, then yeah. we'll let people go. But thanks for the plug. Yeah. Right, right, right here in front. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, Mitch McConnell said the House can impeach, but he will not convict. Shouldn't he recuse himself? Uh, no, he's perfectly welcome to tell everybody how he's going to vote. And the constituents in the state of Kentucky can decide whether or not they want to reelect him or not. And he is up for reelection. Nah, he shouldn't recuse himself, and, and there's nothing to suggest he shouldn't. You've got all the Democrats out in the Senate saying they're going to vote to convict if he gets impeached, so then they would have to recuse themselves as well. So let him have his say, and it's all going to come down to, and, and I mean this sincerely in no pejorative way, it's going to come down to the right-leaning, moderate, white male, businessmen, suit-wearing guys like Mitt Romney in the Senate, in the Republican Party, to give those 20 votes if they want to have him convicted, if, if, if he's impeached. So yeah, I, any senator can say whatever he or she would like to say. But it, I mean, it's a fair point. Thank you all. Okay, You've been wonderful. Thank you very questions. much.